Information Officer of, uh, at the University of Arizona. So, uh, are you guys can hear me? Yes. Right. Muted. Okay. So, uh, I would like to get it started, uh, and I'll give a short introduction uh, of our uh, uh, today's speaker, uh, Daniel Lamb, and uh, Danny will uh, take over and start the uh, the webinar. So. Dan uh, is currently a PhD student at uh, University of Arizona, uh, University of UCLA, sorry, and uh, he has received, but he received his bachelor's degree from University of, of Arizona in Optical Sciences. He also uh, received uh, his uh, master's degree from uh, 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 Stanford in Electrical Engineering. His research is focused on digital broadband linearization of optical links and performing high-speed measurements using time stretch technology under the guidance of uh, 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 Professor Baram Jalali and uh, Asad uh, Madani. He is with uh, Notru uh, Grumman Aerospace System as an engineering since 2009. And he's one of the recipients of North Group Grumman Aerospace System Fellowship. So uh, the topic of uh, his talk is real-time optical performance monitoring using time, uh, time stretch technology. So I would like to hand over to uh, uh, to to Dan and, and let him get started. Go ahead. Oh, there we go. Hey, everybody. Uh, I think I just muted for a sec. Um, so yeah, so good oh, afternoon. Okay. Um, and, yeah. Uh, so good afternoon. My name is uh, Daniel, and I will be talking about real-time optical performance monitoring using time stretch technology. Uh, currently, a PhD student at uh, UCLA under Professor Jalali and Professor Mondi. So before I begin, uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, UCLA. Uh, it's founded in 1919. Uh, it's located in Western California, so I don't know if you guys have uh, been out to UCLA before, but it's basically located on the uh, western side of uh, LA, a few miles from the beach. Um, at the school, there's about 42,000 students, uh, 29,000 of which are uh, undergrads, 13,000 of which are uh, graduate students. And this year, we're the most applied to university in the world with about 105 applicants for both undergrad and graduate students. So there's a lot of people applying. Uh, just, just to tell you a little bit about um, our engineering school, the Henry Simuli School of Engineering and Applied Sciences in our EE department, um, we're usually ranked in the, in the top 10. Uh, we've been ranked number one by uh, Microsoft based on the number of citations uh, that we are given. Um, ranked number 10 uh, according to Times. Uh, according to the National Research Council ranking, we're ranked among the top 10 in the nation. Uh, top three in terms of research funding per faculty and uh, top seven in terms of impact. And at our school right now, there are about 2,300 uh, graduate students in the engineering school. So just to tell you a little bit about the Jalali Lab where I work, um, the Jalali Lab is directed by Professor Bam Jalali uh, in our lab. We have two postdocs, uh, 13 grad students, uh, nine undergrads, and uh, four visiting scientists. And usually our visiting scientists come from all around the world. Uh, we have, um, we, our focus is in uh, several research areas. Um, one is silicon photonics, which covers uh, dispersive elements, uh, EO modulators. Uh, we also do high-speed uh, real-time instruments. So we were able to develop digitizers, uh, spectrometers, uh, high-speed cameras. 
Uh, biophotonics is another area where we do uh, cancer cell detection and fluorescence imaging. And now one of our new research areas is, uh, is big data. And so we use uh, uh, anamorphic stretch transform, uh, which was developed by our lab. Um, we also have several press release coverage um, over the years. So our lab has developed the first silicon laser. Uh, we've also developed the world's uh, fastest camera for cancer cell detection. Uh, the world's fastest fluorescence uh, imager, uh, we call that FIRE. And as I mentioned, uh, we're now uh, doing a lot of work in uh, big data. Um, also, um, our lab developed the silicon photonics calculator for Cyan. So this was uh, debuted by Peter DeVore back at the May site visit. And basically, it's a great educational tool online. Um, basically, you can use it to study uh, different types of uh, upper, uh, optical properties of silicon and uh, related materials. Um, it, it includes um, common dielectrics and semiconductors for waveguide core, cladding, and photo detection um, studies. And you can examine several physical parameters of interest for each material. So a lot of upgrades and um, are being made to this website, such as like waveguide features as well. So we're always looking uh, for feedback on how to improve this website. So now, on to today's talk. Um, first, I'm going to talk about uh, the importance of optical performance monitoring in, uh, in our next generation um, networks. And then I'll give you a brief introduction to time stretch and uh, how it works. Um, next, I will give a talk on uh, real-time TIZER and the role TIZER will play in optical, optical performance monitoring. And then lastly, I'll give uh, two examples of how we use TIZER, and that involves um, integrating TIZER into the Cyan uh, TOAN testbed, which is the testbed for optical agile networks. So first, let's begin with um, why do we need OPM? So optical, optical performance monitoring is basically monitoring the signal quality in your network. And this could be monitoring the BER, or other uh, quality of service parameters. And it is essential for managing high capacity transmission and switching systems. Um, the most important reason is that the customer um, requires a certain quality of service. And, by, and we need performance monitors to ensure that they do uh, meet uh, um, a, a, a specification. So <clears throat> in the future, uh, next generation um, optical networks uh, need to be robust, uh, reconfigurable, flexible, and secure. So in order to create a robust and cost-effective uh, self-managed operation, the optical network needs to be able to um, agilely uh, monitor the physical state of the network and the quality of the propagating data signals and uh, automatically diagnose and repair the network if any impairments are found. Uh, redirect the traffic if necessary, and dynamically allocate resources, and also detect um, accidental and malicious security uh, risks that might uh, occur in the network. <clears throat> so as the capacity of our network increases, uh, impairments reduce the window of operability. So as the demand for faster transmission increases, the complexity in the, uh, and, and complexity increases, um, there's an increase in impact of the transmission impairments on this window. So OPM is, is, is a way of keeping this window open and widening that window. So as we increase data rates uh, with multiple data formats, the system can have many multiple impairments. And so each of these impairments need to be isolated, uh, localized, and compensated. And this would require real-time monitoring and dynamic feedback control. So is there a need for a rapid OPM? Yes, there is. Um, OPM is essential for basically ensuring high quality operation for your intelligent networks. So as networks grow larger and more complex, monitoring a uh, large network is expensive. And so more focus on accurate and automatic automated performance information about this network is required. So what we would need is an OPM monitor that can measure the changes to the data in real time 
and determine ways to compensate for these changes due to these impairments that occur in the in the network. So real-time Tizer um, is definitely a promising technology. So we can use time stretch to do this, and it can uh, generate uh, eye diagrams in real time and be able to provide real-time BER estimations um, uh, to feed back to, say, like a control plane for uh, dynamic control of the of the network and be able to diagnose uh, any impairments quickly. So first, let's take a look at our um, time stretch and how it works. So basically what we have here is a dispersive optical link. And the point of using time stretch is you want to uh, measure an ultra high speed signal. And you may not be able to capture it using um, your current ADCs. And so what you would do is you would take an RF signal and stretch it out in time to allow a slower uh, ADC to capture it. So how does this work? So first you would need to generate a super continuum pulse um, shown here. And you would generate it um, by starting with a Moodlock laser, which basically has a high peak power narrow line width pulse. And you would send it through a highly nonlinear fiber. And so this highly nonlinear fiber um, uh, will broaden the spectrum of this pulse through nonlinear interactions such as self-phase modulation, uh, modulation instability, and a Raman frequency conversion. And basically, the next step is to send it through um, a dispersive fiber shown here in uh, bullet number two. And so using uh, group velocity dispersion, uh, each of the different uh, wavelength components will travel at different speeds in the, in the dispersive fiber, and that will chirp your pulse. So basically what you have here is a wavelength to time mapping. So after that, you have your chirp pulse. Uh, next, you would take your RF analog RF signal, and you would modulate it um, onto this chirp pulse. So what you're, so you're going to get is uh, an amplitude um, modulation onto different frequency components. And then you would send it through a second dispersive fiber, which again uses GVD, and we can stretch the segment out uh, even more. And so at the end, what you would get is a stretched um, electrical signal, which, is, which was your RF signal at the beginning. Um, the stretch factor, how much you stretch it by, is given by this equation. So basically it is the ratio of your second dispersive element divided by your first dispersive element plus one. Oops. So one of the advantages of using Tizer is a sampling modality known as real-time burst sampling. So instead of just sampling at just a single point per sample, we get a segment of points. So this is very different than um, current conventional methods that we use to sample a signal. So one of the most common ones is using a sampling oscilloscope, which is great for measuring repetitive signals. It has a very wide bandwidth, but unfortunately it measures um, signals on the order of like mega samples a second. So what you get out of it will not really be real time. Um, you can also use a real time digitizer which has a much faster sampling rate on the order of giga samples a second, but it's very bandwidth limited. Um, by using real-time burst sampling uh, using Tizer, you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get ultra-wide band bandwidth, and you also get uh, real-time burst, uh, and you can also sample your, your signal with these real-time bursts, and that gives you a very high temporal resolution. On, um, on your signal. So you'll be able to capture features in a single burst that you would otherwise not be able to capture um, using the other two types of uh, sampling uh, modalities. So how would you use this real-time burst sampling? Um, as you can see here, as I mentioned before, we use real-time burst sampling. So if you have a data stream coming in into your optical network, um, each time you sample the optical network, you, ca you would capture like a frame of uh, of data. So using a regular oscilloscope, you would only get maybe like one point per sample, okay, each time you sample it. And so you would be able to just generate, you know, your standard eye diagram. 
um, by, by using uh, Tizer and you collect the whole segment of these points and when you overlay uh, these, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these data points, um, you'll be able to capture um, like a very uh, high fidelity eye. And on top of that, you would be able to capture features that you would otherwise not be able to capture, such as these transients that may occur in your data stream. Uh, another advantage of using Tizer is that there's a very low jitter um, using time stretch. So if you were to start here and sample a regular, uh, an unstretched signal with, with your ADC, you would maybe get like a couple points and the amount of jitter that you would have from your ADC could cause a wide fluctuation in the voltage. Now, by stretching out the signal and use the same ADC, you would have the same amount of jitter, but the amount of amplitude uh, fluctuation would definitely be a lot less. And when you recompress the signal back to its original time scale, you would notice that the amount of jitter is, is significantly reduced by the stretch factor of the system. So using um, Tizer, we have two different types of ways to estimate jitter. Uh, the first one is called intraburst jitter, which basically means in one single shot burst, uh, how much jitter do we get? And so that would be limited by your ADC divided by your stretch factor. So in the current Tizer configuration, an in 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 intraburst jitter would be about 8 femtoseconds. Uh, interburst jitter is for longer time scales, so that involves uh, multiple uh, bursts. And so when we calculate the jitter for that, that's mainly dominated by the jitter of our laser, of our Moloch laser. And so our jitter of the Moloch laser for Tizer right now is about 150 femtoseconds. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the advantages of using Tizer is, is high temporal resolution. So this is an example that, um, of data that we've taken. Uh, basically, it's a 12 and a half gigabit per second uh, PRBS signal. And we're able to uh, compare Tizer with a standard Tektronix 50 gigasample per second real-time oscilloscope. So in one burst, uh, our, our Tektronix oscilloscope would be able to capture maybe two to three uh, samples along the rising and the falling edge. Uh, if you use Tizer, which we stretch, give a stretch factor of about 100 in this scenario, our effective sampling rate is much higher. It was about 250 gigasamples a second. And so we're able to get maybe about 15 to 17 uh, sample points on the rising and the falling edge. So that gives a, a much higher, uh, um, better measurement, you know, with higher fidelity. And you, be, and you would be able to capture um, uh, features that you would otherwise not be able to capture by using you know your standard real-time oscilloscope. Uh, we've also been using Tizer for a variety of different applications in the lab, so it's not you know just for um, BER and for uh, optical networks. So uh, one example is we performed a ultra wideband instantaneous frequency estimation, and so that's this one is to demonstrate Tizer's um, ultra wide instantaneous bandwidth. And so uh, we were able to develop the time stretch instantaneous frequency measurement receiver, which is basically uh, Tizer at the front end uh, with um, windowing and quadratic interpolation on the back end. And so doing that, you would be able to get this ultra wideband instantaneous frequency um, uh, estimation uh, with improved frequency and amplitude estimation by using the quadratic interpolation. And so uh, we, we were able to demonstrate uh, using a single tone sweep um, the wide bandwidth of using Tizer. So every time you would take uh, a, a real-time burst from Tizer, you know, you would, you would sweep basically across like 40 gigs. And so we were able to measure different types of tones, um, different frequencies across 5 to 45 gigahertz. Um, on top of that, we were able to measure multiple signals at the same time as well, which current IFMs are not able to do. Uh, another application of using time stretch technology um, is using it for what we call STEAM, which is serial time encoded amplified microscopy. 
And we were able to develop the world's fastest continuous time camera using uh, time stretch. And so this is a 2D version of time stretch where we were able to map images onto a 2D array of uh, wavelengths. And so we basically are able to generate, um, uh, basically do cancer cell detection. Um, it can also be used for, it's basically used for the real time observation of uh, fast, uh, dynamic phenomena such as like shock waves that we were able to do uh, vibrometry with it, uh, chemical dynamics in living cells, um, laser surgery, uh, flow cytometry for example. So, so, so STEAM is able to achieve about 10 megahertz frame rate and about 100 picoseconds uh, uh, shutter speed or 50 picoseconds shutter speed. And so you can use this in a variety of different applications as well. Um, using time stretch technology, uh, we were able to do a variety of different applications. Uh, one is the detection for the first time of optical rogue waves, which are basically just rare pulses of broadband light. Um, and basically, this, this thing occurs during supercontinuum generation. And so, we, we were able to detect that for the first time. Uh, we were able to develop the world's fastest uh, fluorescence imager, uh, known as FIRE. Uh, the frame rate for this is 4.4 kilohertz. And it's basically an, or, uh, an order of magnitude faster than, than your electron multiplier uh, CCDs. And we were able to, to demonstrate fluorescent mi microscopy at a flow rate of one meter per second. Uh, we were able to create the world's fastest digitizer. Uh, for this example, uh, we measured a 95 uh, gigahertz tone at a sampling rate of about 10 tera samples a second. So, so we were able to develop very, very high speed digitizers because of uh, what time stretch can do. And so we currently hold the record of um, having the world's uh, fastest ADC with the highest ENOB. So, that's, so that covers about 10 gigahertz bandwidth with 8 bits ENOB resolution. And lastly, um, by adjusting, uh, by using time stretch, we can use it for big data applications. And so we have a different version of time stretch called anamorphic stretch transform, which basically makes it possible not only to capture and digitize signals that are faster than the speed of the sensor and the digitizer, but we can also minimize the volume of the data generated in the process because you're able to do uh, feature selective uh, stretching. So basically for like sharper features where you need to sample more. We were able to do. Uh, we were we were able to sample that more and less on the uh, on the lower frequency um, components, and so we've been able to show that this compression technique uh, performs better than like JPEG and JPEG 2000, which are uh, standard formats. So right now, what we want to do is we want to use Tizer um, for optical performance monitoring, and so this is a picture of uh, real-time Tizer. And so what we have here is a picture of Tizer. Uh, it fits in a nice 3U uh, chassis. So we were able to generate our trip pulse source uh, within, uh, within this box. And so inside houses the Moloch laser and the uh, first dispersive element right here. And so our RF input is this PRBS. So we have a PRBS signal. Uh, which feeds into the intensity modulator. And then uh, we can lead that through a second dispersive fiber and it can be detected at the photo detector. And then it can be digitized at the FPGA uh, where in real time this, uh, this FPGA can generate these, uh, these eye diagrams. And then afterwards we can perform analysis on these eye diagrams and uh, and calculate the BER, jitter, rise time, and fall time from, from this information. So here are some uh, features and achievements that we're able to achieve with, uh, with Tizer. So we're able to generate real-time in-service eye diagrams and be able to analyze those eye diagrams. Uh, we can generate an eye in approximately 27 microseconds as opposed to say like minutes if you use like a conventional spectrum analyzer um, or a sampling oscilloscope. Uh, we can also uh, generate time traces of data bits, which is definitely impossible for current, uh, current methods. 
and by using the eye diagram, you can get a plethora of different information which would be useful for optical monitoring, such as like BER, um, jitter, uh, rise and fall time, and you can also measure other uh, parameters as well. Um, Tizer is definitely uh, much low, uh, consumes a lot less power compared to state-of-the-art real-time oscilloscopes. So in order to have the same sampling throughput, you know, you would probably need like racks and uh, a lot of uh, ADCs um, to match Tizer's uh, effective sampling rate. And because of, of uh, Tizer's real-time burst sampling, we're able to capture rare events and transients as well. So some of the major achievements that we're able to, to do with Tizer is that we can generate um, eye diagrams. And so we've been able to show 40 gigabit per second NRC eye diagrams um, in real time. Um, and we're able to uh, record a, um, let's see, and have a record resolution of 8 bits at 10 uh, gigahertz uh, bandwidth as well. And as I mentioned earlier, um, because we stretch it, stretch the signal on time, it definitely helps to relax the ADC bandwidth requirement when trying to uh, digitize the signal. And so this is a picture of, uh, of Tizer in, in the box. So this is the front end, and this is the FPGA. Uh, basically, our FPGA is a custom FPGA board, um, but definitely with custom hardware. And uh, we're able to have a a throughput of about 1.2 terabits per second. So there's a lot of calculations that go into this into this board in order to generate uh, the eye diagram. Tizer's role in OPM. So Tizer would work uh, really well um, uh, in a uh, software-defined network with a, so with a software-defined network control plane, where you have this plane that controls um, basically every optical component in, in the network. And so basically what Tizer would do is it would constantly feed back uh, information about your network. Um, and you can link it up to uh, each, each node in the, in the network, or you can also link it to, say, the transmission line as well. And basically Tizer would, just, uh, would be there to monitor the signal quality uh, at each of these nodes in the transmission line and provide feedback for the SDN control plane in order to optimize uh, optical devices, um, optimize the transmission link. And basically this, this, uh, this real-time feedback that Tizer can give will help enable uh, system management to detect optical link failures and uh, estimate fiber impairments. And that can help assist in uh, physical layer debugging if, if need be. So, so basically because Tizer can uh, feed back all this information to the control plane uh, so quickly, we can reduce uh, mean time to failure and also um, take care of any impairments uh, that, that might arise within the network. So there are two examples uh, where we have used Tizer. Uh, one is at this last site visit um, in, in, the, in the TOAN testbed. So uh, back in uh, May, uh, our the TOAN team spent about maybe like a few months, uh, two, three, two, two months, I guess, um, building up uh, a basically a metropolitan, uh, a simulated metropolitan network. And basically, um, this was a large collaboration effort between uh, UCLA, U of A, uh, Columbia, uh, USC, and Cornell. And basically, the, the test bed, uh, it consists of four, um, let's see, <laughs> four, it contains of four nodes. And basically it, it helps enable us to conduct research on uh, designing an optical network. Um, it was a very large test bed, uh, contained about 20 wavelengths, uh, selective switches, and more than 10 EDFAs. Um, the major challenge uh, in enabling network agility is that transmission impairments and dynamics result in instability and, and uncertainty, which makes uh, dynamic networks harder to predict and control. So then we built this network just to uh, be able to study like these transients, and uh, we would connect each of these nodes using a distance emulator, which we can then inject different types of impairments, like ASC, um, into, in, into there and study how that would affect, say, like a large-scale network. So 
uh, if we were to break open one of these uh, cyan boxes, um, there will be uh, three main uh, planes to this, to this box. One is the SDN control plane, which dynamically controls the optical components within a network. Um, the optical switching layer, which basically can, is comprised of all these wavelength selective switches, and the Caliant optical switch, uh, which helps uh, reroute data, uh, reroute wavelengths uh, very quickly. And the last layer, which, we're, um, which Tizer fit into, is the optical performance monitoring layer, where Tizer and uh, USC's delay line interferometer, which checks um, OS and R, are inserted there. So uh, I'm mainly going to con uh, concentrate on Tizer uh, for this part. Um, so this is a picture of our uh, test bed. Uh, basically, we just filled up the entire room with optical equipment. And uh, basically, we were able to monitor um, BER and uh, be able to um, observe uh, different types of phenomena as we're uh, injecting different impairments into this network. So using Tizer, we were able to observe um, ASC and SPM uh, in real time by generating these eye diagrams. And so you can see the eye diagram change as we're uh, injecting these, uh, these impairments. And so um, there will be probably be, uh, we're working on a uh, paper on that, so I probably won't uh, talk too much about, uh, about that. Um, but yes, uh, yeah, we were able to use that and um, basically study different types of impairments like ASC and SPM. And basically, Tizer's role in, in all this is just to monitor signal quality and provide feedback to the control plane and where corrective actions could take place. Um, so the second example where we use Tizer, it's for uh, real-time in-service monitoring on a commercial platform. So in the U of A Toen, um testbed, uh, there, there's a Fujitsu FlashWave 9500, which is a commercial platform on uh, transmitting uh, bits uh, through the network. And so we were able to stream a video through, uh, through the network. And we were able to use Tizer to tap into the network and be able to monitor its performance. And so what we were able to do was generate an eye diagram as the video was transmitting. And we can show that you know, using real-time Tizer, you can get an eye diagram every 27 microseconds. And then when we plug in a sampling oscilloscope, uh, it would definitely take you know, several seconds or minutes just to be able to collect enough data points for measurement. So this is really like the first demonstration of uh, real-time in-service um, eye diagram generation and, and signal integrity analysis on a commercial platform. And it's because we can generate these eye diagrams using real-time Tizer. So in summary, um, basically real-time Tizer can be utilized for next generation agile optical networks. And uh, as I've shown earlier, uh, we can use real-time Tizer to generate these eye diagrams in real time, and you can perform the signal integrity analysis. And like the last slide that I just showed, we were able to do this for a uh, commercial platform. So this is the first time that this has been demonstrated. Um, Tizer is definitely ideal for uh, in a software-defined network solution um, in, in, in terms of feeding back um, to an agile optical network. And so that would help um, the, the network to have adaptive power control, efficient routing schemes, uh, bandwidth management, etc. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the Cyan Toan team um, for helping make this all possible. Uh, the group was a pleasure to work with, and it was through our long hours of hard work that we were successful in making the testbed a successful collaboration and, and helping us understand impairments in next generation agile networks. Uh, at this point, uh, thank you. For, uh, for attending this talk. Um, at this point, I'd like to open the time up to uh, questions, if there are any.
Okay, I'll try to un so unmute everybody. Yeah. Unmuted. Okay. Everybody is unmuted. Unmuted. Okay, I was wondering, Dan is still with us and can hear us. Yep, I'm still here. Oh, okay. My, I had a question for you, and the question was, can we use the five principle three? That means doing real-time measurement of length and and bad bandwidth as we change it. Uh, sorry, I didn't quite ca Okay. Okay, I, it, it looks like there's some echo in the line. Uh, so the question was, uh, can, can be used Tizer in the flexible grid uh, network, like by changing the the, the wavelength or the bandwidth and make a real-time measurement of that change to see the, the gain in the spectral efficiency? Uh, the answer to that would be um, you would be able to use it in the uh, flexible grid network. Um, it's not really used for checking the uh, spectral um, information though. Uh, for this one, we would we would just check. Uh, it was basically used for a Q factoring for it now, right? From what I've shown. Um, but in terms of showing any kind of spectral measurement, uh, it might be possible if we if we do well. Uh, let's see. If you're looking at optical, um, if you're looking at the optical domain, then this particular tizer is not able to look at at the optical information. Okay. So, what's the next step in uh, in 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 the Tizer uh, research? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> uh, I'm sure. Um, uh, let's see. Well, right now, what we want to do is we want to uh, finish completing the prototype. There's a few upgrades that we want to add to Tizer. Uh, so for instance, like different types of uh, signal integrity analysis, um, we have a few other uh, hardware upgrades that we would like to add to Tizer as well. Um, in terms of um, main development, um, there hasn't been a whole lot of, uh, of other things that we can do with it. Uh, one would probably be maybe developing a coherent version of uh, Tizer, which actually was developed uh, a couple of years ago, um, but it's not at the level of uh, this particular uh, Tizer that we have right now. Okay, so is any other questions from the uh, from our listeners? If you have a question, uh, uh, I, so I so uh, so the question. Go ahead, so uh, yeah. Okay, do you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Hello? Okay, so my question was that are you guys uh, thinking on making Tizer into a product so people can also like purchase it or you know use it commercially? Uh, actually, yes, there is. Um, we are trying to commercialize it. Um, actually, I believe there is a company that uh, there's a website online that I think that um, you can possibly order, uh, well, this is not really commercialized just yet, but yes, we are working towards commercializing uh, Tizer. Cool. Uh, oh, and another quick question is that uh, for the imaging that you use, mm -hmm. that you said that uh, you use Tizer for the ultra-fast uh, imaging? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then um, what kind? You were, um, what pulses did you use? Did you use like femtosecond lasers, or for having those? Oh, for, for the, the snapshots, or you can, yeah. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, for that one, yes, we also used uh, 
like a femtosecond type laser. Yeah, we just use the same Moloch laser uh, for that one. So instead of just um, dispersing it in, in, in one dimension, you can disperse it in two dimensions instead and be able to, uh, you know, have a 2D array of, of wavelengths to, uh, to map your image onto instead. Mm -hmm. And is this, uh, from your knowledge, is it quicker, this was uh, faster than attosecond imaging that people are doing, or very <clears throat> different? Oh, uh, I'm not sure on that one. Um, I'm not sure how the attosecond imaging uh, works. So I probably can't say too much on that. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay.